introduction. Thank you very much for coming over here. I hope that I will not bore you to death. If it would be the case, so please uh, hands up uh, and tell me that so we can change the topic. Um, I will try to um, a little bit uh, put uh, the operations of NATO and as a case study of the Czech Republic to the broader perspective. Um, Peter said I will show you a few figures, uh, some numbers, and uh, how many of you are Czechs, are from Czech Republic? Okay, you will have a slight advantage, uh, because you, of course, I would expect that you know the reality, of, uh, the political reality of the Czech Republic, so, so I would expect that uh, you, will, you, will, you will first you will answer with my potential questions. If you would have any questions or remarks or um, anything in your mind, uh, please jump into my speech and let's have a, let's have a discussion from the beginning. If you would, um, uh, I, I appreciate that. I, I like to start to discuss during the during the during the uh, during the presentation and as. Um, and as uh, Peter said, I used to serve on the Ministry of Defense as the Chief of the Cabinet of the Minister, so I have some experience uh, with the legislative process uh, concerning, the, uh, concerning the operations abroad and, uh, and, and the deployment of the troops. So if you would have any questions in that, uh, in that sense, in that area, so please do not hesitate to ask. Um, Okay, so I divided smart thing. Okay, um, the content of, 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 of the lectures I prepared it, but you can change it in, in, in any way during the time is such this. First, I want to show you some figures concerning NATO's I call it stabilization operations, NATO operations in general. <laughs> then the Czech involvement in military operations abroad, the Czech Republic is like a case study. Um, Probably you would see that uh, the Czech uh, Republic, uh, the case of the Czech Republic, is not so, uh, so not, not so different from the cases uh, you know from your own countries, for example, etc. Because we all in this area, um, <coughs> in the Western area, um, went uh, underwent some processes in the 90s for China and military security. So I have some data uh, about the about the uh, about the operations. Uh, I'll show you the data uh, about the shrinking force. I call it shrinking force. That's uh, that's what we are experiencing uh, since the beginning of May. Some called uh, peace dividend. And then I would like to discuss the reasons for an involvement. Despite the forces shrinking, um, the involvement is still pretty high. So, what's the reason for that? And I hope we can discuss the reasons. How you see it, I think the reasons would be similar for, again, from all countries, and it's just typical. Then I want to present to you the legislative framework, which is very important for the deployment of the troops abroad, and which is, I think, um, a little bit interesting in the public, and we can discuss the political debates again on the case, uh, on the case of the public, but I hope that you will be enough attracted by that to share with me the, the experience from your own countries. Um, it will be very interesting. So at first, uh, would be hardly seen, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pretty small, but um, I will try to explain what's, what's on this slide, um, actually. I tried to collect the, um, the operations of the NATO since 1990, uh, which is not as easy as it sounds, because if you look at the official uh, web pages of the NATO, you would not find um, any, uh, uh, any uh, figures um, imposed based on the relevant methodology, etc. So you have to, I, I had to collect it by myself. So I choose the, the approach. So I counted always the operations which begins in that period. And although 
despite the fact that they could last much more longer, so I, I, I counted them twice. So always, it, it sounds the, the number of, uh, of the operations of NATO during the decade. You know, uh, and it doesn't matter if, if, if the operation lasts 20 years or two years, actually. So it's accounted twice. For example, such a K4, which begins in the, in the 90s and, and ends in, uh, in, uh, in uh, after, after the war. So you see that in a total uh, there are 26 operations. Um, and if you look at where um, um, it begins, uh, should it be hard? Might so. Probably 
lost your main anchor and you are capable to project your power in interventions all around the world to um, other interests. Yes, good. Uh, I think that, uh, yes, you, you're right, um, Marshall. Yes, NATO looked for a reason to exist. Out of area or out of business? Absolutely. Out of, out of area or out of business was the one. Um, another one is, for example, adapt or die. So it was widely expected that the, that the new security uh, environment so totally different after the Cold War. Um, it was a rather, um, uh, you remember, for example, Lone yeah. Super Power, um, US as a, was left on the theater, on the global theater as a Lone Super Power because Soviet Union dissolved, actually. So there were at the moment when many actors, and of course, the new conflicts appeared. Um, Mainly internal conflicts. So of course you were partly right that it's uh, that the member countries want to secure their neighborhood somehow. But the main reason why the NATO too was looking for a reason to exist. And the second was, and very important, the second is also very important. There, at the moment, there was no organization capable, the military capable, what NATO is able to do, because NATO um, is ready for planning, for example. The planning of the operation is one of the main tasks, the interoperability, which securing that the forces from different nations are able to cooperate together. The logistics which could be, which must be united, want to support the, the units from the different countries. So this was very, very, uh, very important, uh, but my first was uh, out of our area, out of business, uh, although it didn't come from the 90s, this, this saying, it was uh, a little bit, uh, from the beginning of the 90s, it was, it was a little late, but still, it was. So, the, I'm trying to open it, um, because first I Memory. This is the other slide, just comparing um, the operations, um, the deployments of the Czech troops since 1990. Again, this is my, my table, my, my sheet, my, my, my figures. There are the numbers, the figures are rough. Because again, this doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Simple, one official sheet with the list of the operation, with the number of personnel who were deployed um, and uh, based on one uh, methodology. So again, take a roughly, for example, the total personnel I counted since 1990 who were deployed as a, as a Czech, from the Czech military in, in, in uh, military operations abroad it's a 33,000 plus. The reason is that always the parliament has to approve each of the deployment. And the parliament approving the number of personnel who can be deployed at one time. That means the parliament agrees with the deployment of 500 troops somewhere. That means that it's a, it's a maximum of troops which can be on that place in one moment. And it's usually for one year. So that means I'm counting, I'm, I'm counting there that the 500 personnel we had deployed broke. But somebody, some, some other counts, looks like, no, because the rotations are on six month basis. So you had 1,000 personnel per year abroad. 500 half a year, 500 half a year. Much more complicated it's given with, with the Air Force because they usually have the rotation time at the moment. So, I, I'm, I counted just the mandate, let's say, which was done by the parliament. But if we would like to know how many persons 
were deployed in, in total. You will count, count every soldier in the year. I guess my rough estimate would be that this number will be plus 50%. So we will talk about the 45,000 people in the last, I don't know, it's, it's 20 years now. It's, yeah, 20, 30 years almost. Okay. Again, the operations, I'm counting the operations which began. So that means that every year you, you can find the operations like the price. Uh, I'm not counting K4, for example, as a one operation. I'm counting it for a year. And I'm trying to download that. Um, and, okay, yeah, because uh, I need to see. I need to see. Uh, okay, so the first operation, um, the check, uh, check. Check, uh, check troops place, which you can see. I'm um, sorry for that. It was in 1990, 1991, um, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Gulf War. Uh, it was uh, like a very first operation in the 90s. It was a very brave decision of, of, of that time politicians to, to, to go there with the, with the chemical units and, and the guard in it, actually. And it was like 200 people. Um, then the involvement. Um, Continue because in Iraq um, uh, we had between like uh, 91 to 03 as a, as, a, as a guards and observers and, and advisors we had like 320 people in those I you know 11 12 years so so the president has just been public the president in, in, in Iraq since the beginning of the 90s to uh, to to 203 let's say 202 203 then um, the, the the but the big operation. Um, the huge operation for the Czech Armed Forces began in, 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 in the beginning of the nineties with the breakup of Yugoslavia and with the involvement in, in the Balkan. Um, just for image um, there, in UNPRO 4, it was the United Nations Protection Force at that time, it was not NATO, but the United Nations uh, operation um, from 92 to 95. That means that in those four years, let's say, there were uh, in total uh, 2,250 troops, Czech troops. Um, even bigger portion was in an in a I-4, S-4, which was an annual operation after, after the data agreement. I don't know, you know, you are familiar with that, with the data agreement and with MAFI, with the uh, when, 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 when the uh, Yugoslavian President Milosevic was, was, was pushed to, was forced to sign the agreement. Uh, they don't, they don't, they don't, and the guarantor of the Dayton Agreement became the NATO. Uh, it was composed first, uh, first, um, you know, first operation, it was, uh, it was I-4 um, force, which was sent there um, in 205. Uh, the Czech military took the place. And in I-4, S-4 and S-4-2, that means between the years uh, 96 to 201, so it's like, if I count well, it's like of five, six years, it took uh, 6,300 troops. Again, very mandated to stay there. So that means it's like a thousand per year. It was a really a huge contingent. We were able to keep them. Then, um, K4, of course, um, uh, K4, if I'm counting well, um, I have three deployments over here um, because they were slightly different. It was 1992, 202, 202, 205, which was uh, the Czech and Slovak battalion, which was deployed there, and 205 to 211. So it was almost roughly, if I'm counting that, it's almost 9,000 persons, the, the Czech. And the biggest portion um, began with Afghanistan, actually. Um, we were, I think the Czech Republic was quite, uh, quite active over there in Afghanistan since, uh, since its beginning. Um, the first operation in Afghanistan uh, was 202, 203, um, the field hospital, um, which was quite, uh, it was like a 280 personal. And then it began in 204, well, began bigger deployments. Um, and if I just count it well, um, it's like, um, and we are still, the Czech Republic is still present in, uh, in various, various, various places in 
guys know, I'm sure that you've just that. Um, you've done everything, BRT, you had a BRT loader. Um, we, we, we run a few uh, omelets, uh, the military police, uh, special forces, the, 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 the paratroopers. Um, and um, just if you take ISAF, uh, BRT, uh, I don't know, BRT, are you familiar with that? Provincial Reconstruction Team, that effort was in, um, in the late 2000, um, 2005 plus. Um, their first experience with the PRTs, Provincial Reconstruction Teams, uh, was in Iraq, actually, where, where the US tried to deploy the, 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 the teams, which could assist with the development, with the training, uh, uh, training the governments, local governments, <coughs> training the uh, security forces because it was a huge gap, especially in, in Iraq where all the security forces and the military disappeared um, from day to day. And a lot of uh, mayors and, and, and a lot of people who govern the local, local regions disappeared. So, so, so the, the Iraq Aftermath, the invasion was a great example of the failed state of Italy because it was unruled. Um, ex except few regions, it was unruled. Um, and it's a fight began. A fight began. So the Afghanistan was, was similar after this long, long civil war um, to, to, to start new rule of law again. Um, it's been so a lot of training and teaching. Uh, so it was the PRTs began. So usually PRTs were composed by military military contingent and by civilian experts. Um, so we had, for example, in Lauder, we had the experts for agriculture, we had the experts for media, experts for security, um, experts, I don't know, for anything you can imagine. So it's a great change there and then they try to do their, their job with the local communities and to to help them to so again so but if you look at the uh, the PRT first fights about a new order um, in 207 2013 <laughs> there were like a three thousand personal military personnel were deployed in order. In one time for example it's a few years in, this year, in some years, uh, we had the biggest, uh, biggest deployment from all the, a lot of countries involved in the province, and we had to take care of that. All provinces, for sure. Uh, then you have, for example, we, we, we had a deployment of also the helicopters, so we had um, in Afghanistan, which is quite demanding, it was like 700 people um, from 2009 to 2011, because it's sustainable in the system of mine. So, um, in total, if I'm looking there, um, I would just, my rough estimate um, for, for Afghanistan would be about eight, seven, eight thousand people in, who, who were deployed there. Um, just concerning mandate, I'm not counting you know, the people who were deployed there. And of course, not only the NATO, uh, but also the Enduring Freedom. Started after 2001, after the um, September 11 attacks, uh, which was anti terrorism operation, actually, uh, flew all globally and was uh, orchestrated by US. Not, 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 it was not a NATO operation, although the NATO countries uh, um, deployed the troops and, and so this is it. And even, even now, if I'm looking at that, um, so uh, to finish this table, I just wanted to. I, I, I hope that I'm not boring you. I just wanted to give you an overview of uh, one country, uh, you know, like the Czech Republic with 10 million people. Um, but, you know, such a large deployment we have on a different, 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 uh, different places in the world. Um, so, let just put, I will kind of tell you where we have the people right now, actually. 
So we have uh, the 217 if I'm looking. So Afghanistan, Turkey, Iraq. So we are in Iraq on a bilateral basis at the moment. We are training the pilots over there. We have a field hospital there, and we have a training training teams over there. So uh, we have observers in some African countries. A uh, few people in Althea, which is EU operation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, um, yeah, we, have, we are quite active actually in uh, air policing. Uh, we are doing the on a rot rotation basis uh, with, with our allies. We are doing the, the air policing over the Baltic states and over the Iceland. So this is always like deployment for the, you know for a few months in the year, and then again. Um, we are active in a, in an MFO Sinai. I don't know if you know MFO, uh, multinational force and observers. Have you heard about? No. This is such a special operation, which was started I don't know in the, I think in the late 40s, um, with the with the with the born of the Israel the state Israel. It's not the UN. It's not the NATO, it's not the EU, it's, it's the operation which was based on the agreement between the United States and other, like, I don't know how many, five, some countries. So they signed an agreement. So, so we have a moment, or in the last four years actually, we have the observers there, and we have the team with the, with the, with the CASA playing for the transport. So we are in Cine, um, we have somebody on HQ of Atalanta, and, and we have people in Mali, actually. It's, about, it's a large contingent, but it's about 40, 40, 40, 40 people uh, in Africa, uh, which is EU operation. Um, uh, yeah, we have a few people on the Mali, uh, you and the uh, EO, and of course Iraq, I talked about Iraq. Air advisory team, field, field surgical team, and MP training in the moment. So this is the this is this is the um, justice overlook that uh, I have to okay. Um, later, as I told you, we can discuss the. Uh, I want to discuss the reasons why the why the chance of the country of ten million people doing this in in such an extent. Uh, so, um, I will quickly jump into the, if you see that, just remember that this expand sheet with the deployment of the troops. And now I want to show, show you the shrinking force, actually, which is very important. First, if you look at the budget, um, the check and budget between 205 and 2016. Um, I will then show you the, 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 the from the 90s. But no, I have this. So, um, bottom is green one. This is real budget. This is what the Ministry of Defense spent at the end of that particular year. So, if you look at what happened um, in 2005 to 2006, the budget was like this. And now we are here in 2016. And we are talking all time about how security situation changed, so we have to be active, how we have to deploy the troops. But the monetary reality or reality of the money is totally different. The other perspective, uh, you can see this unfortunately, see, but you can see here the development of the budget in the sense of um, uh, GDP. These are the billion of revenues. So this is the GDP. And you see in the 95, where we were in the well, 98, 99, we were like in the 1.9%, something like that. And since that time, we dropped to 1%. And even Two years ago, um, the, the, the budget was, um, the, the real budget was, was below 1%, which is quite striking if, you, if you're looking that figures before, if you're looking for the proclamation about the new world, new security situation, and you see the figures, which are totally different, which are saying the opposite. And I think that this is one of the things we, 
uh, we can see um, in Western world nowadays, since the 90s, um, in every country almost. It's a few of them. Um, if I'm talking about the lies. Um, I, I quite understand why Mr. Trump and Mr. Obama pushed the DLIs to spend more money on the defense. And of course I understand why, why the especially European countries are reluctant to do so. Prime Minister, I would say, because the, you know, if you know that, uh, that, uh, that same or description, uh, which is describing the dilemma called butter and guns. I don't know if you know that. Butter versus guns. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is this is this is a very good description of the dilemma, uh, for, especially for the for many European countries. Because the butter, I'm always saying that the defense is a, must be in the first place. Defense and security is why the states are born, why the communities are born in the first place. Not because the social welfare. They are born because the people want the safety. That's why they gather together in the villages. They buy the elected the or the elected. The some were guardians, some were mayors. This is because the order, some were judges. But I'm afraid that this change throughout decades, especially in Europe and the social welfare state that butter, you can deliver to the voters, to the public. It's much more important than security because we began to take security somehow for granted in the past, since, since the Second World War. And we hope that the world will be better, the world, of course, we will have to take care of it. But it's a totally, it was a totally wrong discussion. Okay, this is the, what I'm saying about, from the point of view of NATO. If you look at the Allies, unfortunately, you cannot see it clearly. Um, it's a frustrating a little bit, but, I will try to describe what it's, what's in that. This is the official NATO figure, which is not mine, so, so you can believe. <laughs> this is the defense expenditure as a percentage of the of, of the GDP and the equipment expenditure, which is which is as a percentage, which is very important. So this water is a road. It's, it's, it's a road. There are those uh, who are not doing well, actually. And you see the majority of the alas in <laughs> that part. So it speaks for itself, actually. So this is not only, um, you see the, the Czech Republic, which is some, somewhere four, four fifth from the tail, actually, of the NATO concerning the expansion. Of course, you can say that the, that the expansion of the defense is not all. Quality of the force is, of course, also more, etc. Really, but if you want to compare, you have to find some marks you can compare, and this is clear. You, you can compare. This is not the only one, but the others are as good as as, as, as this one. And this is a project in. The Clinton expansion, which is which is the, which is saying a lot of the investment to the force. What's even worse, the personal. If you look at that, it's a, of course it's a Czech Republic example again, but you can I'm sure you can find it. Of course, you can say that the new technologies, high tech, you know, high tech toys, you know, gadget can uh, can can easily replace the, the human. No. To some extent, maybe. But at the end, you always need the human, the man. I like Terminator. I was <laughs> stuck in the 80s. Yeah, it was a new, 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 new film, new movie, that. But I don't believe that it will be reality. And then the humans defeated the, 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 the human attention. 
So if you see the Czech, uh, Czech example, um, we have the conscription army up to the 205, uh, 204, and 205, since 205 we have the adjustment professional armed forces. So the green one is the number of conscripts. The blue one is the number of, of, of professionals. <coughs> the data are up to 2012 for General State and the label over this data are from my colleague, but I was not able to add to, to the other. But it doesn't matter, it's a just look at the trend. You see that we have like well, there are almost 40,000 professionals at the beginning of the 90s, in the 93, and about the almost 70,000 conscripts. So we have an armed force which have like a 110,000 uh, people, personally. Remember that sheet uh, this, with, with the deployments of the Czech troops, bro? So in that time, there were a lot of troops to take, you know, to choose for a deployment. And, uh, sorry, but the conscripts are not deployed, right? Conscripts not, but when the conscript, uh, when, when the conscript ended his service, he could ask uh, as, a, as a reservist to be deployed. And he could wait like a, for a half year. It was very often with the unit performer involved in, in, in the UN operation. But a lot of conscripts, you know, when they finish their service, they ask to be deployed. And they but, but wasn't it that during the Gulf War, the Czech soldiers were actually even conscripts, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because conscripts are not armed. Because you are unable to. Uh, because the, the, that time conflict was 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 prepared for, uh, to be war of attrition. So conventional, huge conventional forces, and you always need uh, huge forces, you many, you know, personal mass of the troops. So you, you cannot do it without the conscript army. Uh, because you are able to mobilize, but it takes a time and you need the person to be trained, etc. Just another story. So, the force shrank that way, and there is some even more deployments. So what is saying to you that this is, that is happening? What would you say? That it happening, that, that what's the result of that force? That extends deployment. What do you think that is happening to that force? What's the wrong side of that? It's a drawing. It's drawing the force because the, there's you don't have to be enough personal um, to do the like daily business. That means the training, the recovery, etc., etc. The some units such as uh, four brigades. They are deployed almost all the time. It just, of course, it has a positive effect on that force, on the troops, because they are much more experienced. But negative, uh, in the long term, negative, uh, negative um, effect on, on, on that unit, um, as it is. So you see, the, this red line is the 26,000 troops, which was a goal which was set up in like 202 or sometimes in, in the one of, uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the materials, uh, strategic materials. It was never reached since that time. The closest was 207. And now the situation on the, on the labor market is even worse because there is a less and less people in the, uh, and it's not only in Czech, again, it's not only Czech Republic, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a European problem, actually. There's less and less people in that uh, cohort, so in, the, in, the, in the ages from 19 to 28. It should be, you know, the best for the, for the, for the military service. Of course, for the, um, if you have a, the officer, officer usually is spending some time in school, etc. So it's coming to the troop like 26. 20, 25, 26 years old, but you want the mass. Still, you need the mass of the guys between 19 to 21 to 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 go and serve. But there's the less and less people on the market can go there. So this is going to be a big problem. The, the demography is going to be a big problem for all of us to do it. Um, in the area of defense.
So, and now, um, okay, reasons for the moment. Why the Czech Republic? Um, and think also about their countries. They are our countries. Because the reasons, I would guess, would be sometimes the same. So, what would you say that there are reasons for an involvement in the military operations of Europe? Yes, sir. Sorry? Humanitarian intervention. Mm, yes. Okay. okay so yes, I would call it rather idealism, but okay. Yes, this would be one reason. Uh, obligations from uh, partnerships and treaties. Um, there are no treaties which would oblige you to intervene anywhere, um, to be to, to, to make a peacekeeping operation anywhere. So so yes and no. I would I would call it different a little bit. So, second guess? To be better than mine, let's say. All to right. show that we are active too. Okay, you wanted to say. Okay, perfect. So, other reasons? This is actually, it's a, if you look at that, I don't know if you can read here, this quote by Václav Havel. Our military has thanks made into its missions and scale of some units. Very good name between the allies. So this is one of the reasons to do better. We are uh, we are giving uh, we are exp we are spending less and less on the defense, but we are able to keep large deployments abroad in the say of the alliance. So this is one like a trade-off. Okay, don't bother us with the budget because we want to spend it elsewhere, but we will send troops abroad, and if everything will be perfect unless uh, Mr. Trump will jump into the game. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Another idea? Okay, I will try to roll up my. At first, for us, um, it could be special. It's written to the West to show that we are belonging to the West and we are willing to not only enjoy but take the obligations. To help. I know this. I call it rather idealism. I was saying about the humanitarian intervention and the stuff that we are able to intervene somewhere, we are able to secure the world and diminish the wars. Um, I don't think so, but in the 90s there were such hopes. Maybe some of you would remember that even Maslow Havel was pro at the beginning of the 90s, pro the solvent of NATO as an obsolete organization of the Cold War, because the world would be different, it would be run by the collective organization. Which one? Mm -hmm. UN. Perfect. UN. After the, after the Gulf War, it was one of the few wars which were approved by Security Council. Securing the neighborhood. In the 90s, securing the neighborhood, especially in the Balkan, actually, because the, of course, because the war uh, and security, migration, etc. And then it came with, after the September 11th, especially it was a terrorism vision to, to deny safe heavens to the terrorists. So that, that's usually the reason uh, why the forces are deployed in Afghanistan. So it's usually the, the, the accusation by explanation, the argumentation, that if we were being in Afghanistan, the terrorists would not come to Europe. And as was shown a few years ago, actually, um, when the the ISAF ended in Afghanistan and the troops began to withdraw, the number of migrants from Afghanistan, the people who seek refuge in, the, in in Europe, rose. So, so there's I don't want to say that 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 it's a, there's a causality. But you can, sign, you, you can see that there are some interconnections. Participation as a way to become a member of NATO, which was very important, important not only for the uh, Czech Republic, but for you know, Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and other Baltic states. Um, because I don't know if you, if you know that in the 90s it was a not small opposition in the United States for uh, enlarging the NATO. 
So there were fears, a lot of fears, um, that, that, that the new countries will become just another black passengers and would enjoy the security of you know. So it was very important to show that the, 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 the even country of Chicago could add something to the United effort, actually. Proof itself as a good ally despite the shrinking force and budget. We discuss it. Keeping transatlantic links strong. This is very important for countries like the Republic of Central Europe with, with the history, as you can imagine. The one thing which is very important is to keep the United States in the Europe. To attract them, attract, attract them to be over here in Europe and not let the be uh, ruled by, by traditional parts. Why? Because always the Central Europe was always uh, or something like that, was always belonged to Russians or to Germans and always they fought in this area for centuries. So the, for us it's very important to have a here such as stabilization, which are the United States. Which the United States are. Changing the military and personal benefits. Uh, this is a pragmatic problem said. The military is changing by the experience in the, in the, in the, in the, in the operations of Europe. It is a pros, which is pro is a, you have a but a trained force um, on a real conflict or post-conflict situation. So you have to deal with the situations that you will not, not be able to deal over here. Or train. But on the other hand, what happened is, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a connected with the, with, with the training of the force, our knowledge and experience of the military shrank to a small unit as a battalion or a platoon. Because if you are not deploying the larger units, we forget the art of the war on the level of division, for example. We have army, armed forces are fighting to learn it again. We learn it by sending the, sending the officers into the, into the H, HQs, um, uh, such as division, etc. But, but we lost this knowledge. You know, the guys know how to, how to maneuver a uh, platoon on the battlefield, but they are not trained properly to, to, to maneuver um, uh, brigade, for example. You know, it's three, three to five thousand people. You know, so a few, a few years ago, it was a very, like it was in the media, the, the, the Czechs, uh, Czech, Czech, now the general, that's he uh, commanded, you know, such, such a Brigade in 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 the German country, and it was the first time the Czech Czech officer after many years done so. But it still needed for the purposes of your your army. What what you doing? Because you are actually Absolutely. fighting small wars. You don't need such a you know you don't need to employ brigades in fighting uh, insurgencies. And Good point. So. You know the future. <laughs> well, there is conventional veterans, so you know, I, I don't see any big, you know, big power. Uh, I mean, big war between superpowers. You know the history? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be. You have to have always the doubts about what's going to happen. You have the armed forces. Every country has its armed forces. Has its armed forces, primarily for defending its territory. This is primary goal, and this goal didn't change. So, so you need the conventional force. You have to be able to mobilize trustfully, because you have to, as a state, deter. All the time you have to deter. Even if we are believing that we are living in a beautiful, peaceful world, if we are not. We are just like if we are in the middle. You know, we are just surrounded by friends, but, but some are not. So this is always the same. You need to be ready. You need to be ready. It's a historic, historic question. And people are the same. You know, people are not changing throughout the years. 
and the gates and, and, and hundreds and thousands of years through all the history. If you look at the you are behaved quite similar. So as a state, as a responsible state, as somebody who's responsible for, for defending the state, must be ready because then <coughs> nobody wants to be blamed as the worst politicians of worst politicians because they forget the uh, they forget on the defense of the country. So, yeah, well, uh, I agree with you, but uh, I think like general depends on the security threat that is the state faces. I mean, and the, this, I mean, this uh, defense planning, I mean, the sports planning. I mean, yeah. it depends. I mean, like if you're a small country and you have your face like coming like huge, I mean, uh, the, you, I mean, you're probably, you perceive that your primary threat comes from the like you're a very asymmetric tool. I mean, then you have like very small mobile and small like self-sufficient good um, units. I mean, to have like absolutely. You, you are right. You always compromise it. You don't. Uh, you know. You both right. Yeah, you can have everything all. You can have you can have all. But you have to think about. Yeah. Another example is. Yeah. So what you are saying is correct for now, and it's correct for us 10, 15 years. Absolutely agree. And maybe it will be correct for the next 20, 100 years. Maybe for it. I don't know. <coughs> which is uh, which is really bad is uh, is um, losing the knowledge because the people who know something, for example, about logistics. Logistics is you know most of the people are always talking about the combatants. Yeah, right. Rather, let's talk about the logistics first because the combatants they don't they don't combatants are for one combatant you like for one combatant you like for one you see guy like that. Absolutely, you have to yeah the logistics is not. You're losing by another day to, uh, to, to make a logistic pipeline for a large units, you are losing the skills. <laughs> you don't know how to plan, which is most important. So you have to keep, you have to find some balance. Of course, you cannot act, even if the Czech armed forces would be like 200 people or 300 people, it would not be still enough for the, uh, for, for cover the defense from all possible, uh, you know, base from north. From all the time, it will not be possible to this sort of time. But um, our force is, is too small, and what I'm saying is that you need to keep the knowledge about how to run the convention. If you lose it, it's hard to learn, learn real learning. You can easily teach somebody to shoot the weapon and send him you know, on the front to be killed, you know, just to have a mass. You can do it in the peaks, actually. But, uh, but good logistician, good specialist in the other areas, such as the such as the reconnaissance, etc. You will, you will have to teach them for years. I'm not saying that uh, we have to forget uh, the lessons you know, in history. I what I'm just saying is that uh, there is no Absolutely. evidence saying that the, the, the future wars are going to be bigger than Absolutely. those there are nowadays, that we have nowadays. And uh, something like a maneuvering of huge brigades is very unlikely. It's really it's not huge, actually. Okay, so so it's a Roman legion, so yeah, so it's big. yeah. But yeah, there's a, I understand. I absolutely understand what I'm saying. What you're saying, and I accept it. Absolutely. I'm just saying you have to think. You need it. So you have to make a preparation to have knowledge yes. and to have a, to have a, in, tools in your disposal to use them. If the worst of the worst book. Yes, sir. Isn't it this problem somehow mitigated by linking the Czech brigades with the Polish divisions of the German? Absolutely, absolutely. Because that's absolutely. the scenario. Yeah, this is this is how you, for example, trying to um, trying to uh, trying to balance it, trying to find a way out, out of it um, uh, with the connecting the DRs um, to cooperate and you know, making uh, divisions, etc. And, and you don't need to have a buff. You have your officers. In the HQ, so the division, but well, you don't have, you don't need to have the bomb. And, you, and if, and you believe it's based on a trust, that if worse out of the worst will come, that the others will react as you expect. So this is why important is, you know, that spending, because it's a matter of trust. How seriously the allies taking the alliance and the history. Teach us one thing. If the trust between the allies 
disappeared, the alliance disappeared. And especially for us, like for Czechs, for example, the NATO is we are we are most secure in the hundreds of years because the NATO has guarantees around the situation. So I don't like to lose this umbrella. Let's say. So I'm quickly. I still have some time. Okay. So jump <coughs> to, to the legislation because I was asked uh, if you would not be interested. Uh, tell me, I'm the young minister, and we can discuss. It. Anything else? No. So, uh, legislation framework. Uh, <laughs> many countries for the deployment of troops is a constitution. Uh, Czech constitution is uh, quite uh, quite strict. Notes. Okay. It's quite frustrating concerning the operation, concerning the deployment of the troops. If you look at the parliament, gives its consent to the sending the armed forces of the Czech Republic outside the territory of the Czech Republic, the stationing of the armed forces of other states within the territory of the Czech Republic, unless such decisions are reserved to the government. The other, the other article says that. I'm saying in the next slide that the government to secure absolute majority in both houses, which is not easy to secure. Why do you think that the Czech constitution is such a restriction? So, Czech folks? No? You don't know? Okay. One of the main reasons is year 1968. And uh, it was the invasion for, for, for you who don't know that. Sorry, it is an invasion to Czech, Czechoslovakia at that time, an occupation for the next 10 years by Soviet and troops, especially as When the constitution was written in the beginning of the 90s, it was a main fear how to, to, the, to the future, how to defend the sovereignty and the wrongdoing of somebody's power, using its power of somebody to invite the forces on a legal basis, because there were always discussions if the Soviets were invited legally or illegally, because they were invited by the letter by few politicians in that time. Yeah. So it was a very restricted. It said that just the parliament, absolute majority of the both houses, must agree with the stationed troops. And the guys who wrote the constitution really not think that the deployment of the troops in abroad will take will be in such extent and uh, and uh, will be needed in such extent much more than the. Than the, uh, than, the, um, uh, than the inviting the forces over here. So they just add that the deployment is the same as the invitation or stationing of foreign troops on the Czech land. So they put it together and it's made it very restricted. So this is the story how it began in the 90s because nobody thought that the deployment in mean, such extent would be a Czech restriction. But it stayed there. So you have to uh, you have to secure it. So legislative framework. It's a grueling process. It's, it's quite easy. Usually, um, on the Minister of Defense, it begins uh, work on the plan uh, um, for deployment, uh, which is uh, which is partially uh, partially based on the on the requests from the Alliance, for example, from the UN, from the EU, from other organizations. Of course, uh, hope hope that it's always tied somehow to the to the interests, uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy and in national interests, and it's mixed up and then it's presented to the government and of course it's very good when MOD in this stage even began to discuss with the legislators about the ideas, about their intentions, because the worst thing is to be surprised uh, during the during the moment, during, during the, during the moment. 
Then the government, if government approves the plan, prepared by the Ministry of Defense, the plan is usually for two plus one year. Um, in, the, in the past, it was just for one year, and every year the parliament had to approve the plan, which caused the complications because uh, because uh, it was always under the pressure, and usually the, the, the approving legislature, because you have to pass it through both chambers, uh, was done in the, in the autumn, so sometimes at the beginning of December, uh, <coughs> nobody knows if, if the mandate uh, uh, from January 1st next year will be. And if it will not be approved, we have to immediately withdraw the troops, which if you have three, four hundred people abroad, it doesn't take one day. It takes some time. So it was always very nervous. Uh, so. It was an agreement that uh, the, the money is usually for two plus one years. Two years are uh, binding. Uh, one year is just a perspective. When the Ministry of Defense or government is saying, okay, we think that the third year we could be there and we could be there. Parliament is consists of a uh, chamber of deputies, just 200 people, and Senate, just 81. Committees began to discuss it. First, and then it goes directly, directly to the chambers. It doesn't say every, any, anywhere. It's, it's not say that in the constitution which chamber which chamber must go first if, if, uh, if chamber of deputies or if senate. It's it's nowhere said, so it doesn't matter. It's usually it's uh, done, for example, as the last time this year actually because there were some discussions and problems in the chamber, chamber of deputies. Uh, the, uh, and the Senate, Senate was broke, so the Ministry of Defense or government went to the Senate first and approved it and pressed the Chamber of Deputies, oh, Senate, agreed with that, so by, by you. So you can play with that a little bit. If there is a situation that, that, uh, that Senate or Chamber of Deputies will approve the different kind of mission which are their right. They can say, okay, from the list of the missions we are approving just this and this and this. And the both chambers will do it, or one will leave the governmental proposal and the other will agree just with some operations. Then just some operations are valid, are agreed, are approved, let's say, if you understand it just if you have a ten and one chamber will agree for three, so just the three are good. So, you can play with that. It's a lot of politics around, of course. So, as you can expect, the approving is time to time complicated. And it's, of course, influenced by general political situation. When somebody is trying blackmail, the other one, I will agree with that if something like that. Uh, the other step happened, usually tied with the domestic political situation. Since 1990, the majority of the operations were, the majority of the political force in the Czech Republic were pro deploying the troops, pro being active. It doesn't matter in the NATO, or the UN, or later in the operation. The exception, and consistent exception from the, from the, from the other members, are communists, which are always against the operations, <coughs> using various arguments, and usually far right nationalists are against. Again, using the different arguments, we need the troops home and not abroad. He needs our military to defend ourselves, not be somewhere in Afghanistan or Africa. Doesn't make any sense, etc. So these are the arguments against. But such a consensus, political consensus about operations, lasted up to uh, 2010, uh, 2008. Sorry, 2008. When it happened. Uh, in 2008, in December, when the, 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 the plan for the mandate came to be 
to the uh, to the Chamber of Deputies, and the political situation was really like stalled and between opposition and the government, they have the, almost the same uh, same number of deputies. And communists were always again, so you had to secure it's a month. You had to secure more than 100 people, but the communists can have like 10 to 14 people. There are you know making smaller. The pool is smaller then because they will be always against the human count. And what happened in, in, in December 2008, the Social Democrats, uh, because the rifts with the that time government who wanted to change, make some changes in healthcare and, and in the health, they uh, said that they will not approve the plan for admission. Uh, and when it he began voting, um, like uh, you know, it was like a fight in two guys. Um, the operations, the plan, the mandate was not approved. It was December. So what happened? The government used the fourth uh, paragraph. The government may decide to send the armed forces of the Czech Republic outside the territory of the Czech Republic and to allow the stationing of the armed forces, blah, 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 for the states within the territory for a permanent period not extending 60 days in matters concerning the fulfillment of blood obligation pursuant to treaties and collective self-defense, B, participation in peacekeeping operation, C, participation in rescue operation, etc. So government used this paragraph 4, the article 43, and immediately approve uh, deployment of the entire troops, especially in Afghanistan. The Social Democrats always had a problem with, with, with the Afghanistan. They, they were always split uh, on Afghanistan. Um, so um, it was not only the domestic domestic reason, the, the healthcare and the rifts with the, with the government it was also the, the, the rift between the part. Um, so government used these 60 days and. Within January and February, I think it was January, I was able to secure the INA votes for the ruling of Monday. It was only one time when it's, uh, it's went to, to such a you know, better situation. Usually, it's every time there are some discussions, but usually, there could be fine at the end a compromise and, uh, and, uh, and secure, and, and then there will be enough, enough uh, votes to secure. What I'm saying is that some people are saying that these political debates about the mandate, about the deploying of the troops, are not the good thing because damaging our image in the eyes of the, of the allies, etc. Et I'm only saying one thing. Using of the force is sovereign political act must be decided by the politicians. And debates are really important. The decision about deployment cannot be done by the military. Because military serves to foreign policy and national interests. And the control is extended through the legislation, civil authority, and budget, of course. And I think that this is very important to keep it, to keep it in mind. So, although I disagree with the voices who are saying that we should not be deployed in Afghanistan or in Iraq, I understand that <coughs> even me, I have doubts about the deployment somewhere, how it serves to our national interest and to our foreign policy. If we are not just drawing our force, which are rare and scarce at the moment, because it's shrink, but the, the debate about it is really important. And one of the reasons why it is important is the public, is the society, are the voters. Because it's driving the debate within the society. Hope to, it's, it's, it's helping formulate 
the means, let's say, the means of the society, which is which is which is which is really 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 important. I would say, um, if as a politician you are not listening to the society, to the public, it can lead to a disaster. Uh, we saw in the past, not much of the public as well, but, but definitely Afghanistan was one of the cases when the, uh, the, when the society was split in half. The Iraq was even worse than it because we were deployed, we have the troops deployed in Kuwait, which was crossing then the border to Iraq, to, to certain, certain Iraq to help there in, in, like for a humanitarian case, but still the troops were active there. We had a deployment over there in, in Iraq and because it was uh, it was just purely the US uh, US operation, which was very I think that you experienced it all actually that even in your countries was the same. The public was split. If it's if if it was the invasion was, was correct and uh, correctly argumented or not. So this happened everywhere. And if you are not listening to the public, uh, to the mood, it can really change and it can really change and in the long term it would cost you from and it was, it would drive the, 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 the people to those who don't want to be active, who don't want to be born, who don't want to don't want to rely on people. So what I'm saying is the political discussion level the military operations are just vital. So the other thing is that you also a big disadvantage. Because in some countries you have a parliament, you have parties that are not very well educated in regards to foreign policy and uh, international politics. And, uh, you know, they would argue that uh, you don't really need that knowledge because you just have something that would be in Slovakia, you know, called Sandiatsky or something. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Correct, yeah. English translation. Come on, come on, come on. Common sense, come yeah. Sense. But uh, those issues are so complex and, and specific that common sense is just just something that cannot help it with dealing with that. And in those cases, that I think it would be uh, maybe actually better if those uh, decisions would be left on the educated and smart people uh, in ministries of foreign affairs and yeah. ministries of defense. Um, yes, the discussion is the same over here, and this, this, these arguments are the same over here. Okay. I will say, um, say it this way, um, the Chamber of Deputies, if I take, is not composed by the experts on the foreign policy. And they have, a, they have a right to privilege, and they're doing it as well. They are deciding on the foreign policy. So I think that that common wisdom is uh, making sense at times. And I think that you have to, people, you have to public, uh, let's say, educate. Not, not forcefully, I believe that, that you can educate that you can educate them by, uh, uh, by, um, you know, by those public debates. Remember, for example, who knows uh, anything before Afghanistan? Uh, anything about Afghanistan? Before 202, for example. Yes, you knew, okay, it's a map, it was a shah, all of that, etc. You know, from how much we learned since that time. So it's a just example, it's a perfect example, but it is. Um, the other example I would, I, I would say what's the difference between the deployment of the troops in the sake of a foreign policy of the state and the decision to build the nuclear power plant? just beside your house. I think that the people who are living in that house should have a chance to say something, despite the fact that they are not the physics and the engineers you know, uh, building the nuclear plant. They don't know anything about it. You know, they just have the physics. They just at the end buy the arguments of somebody else or not. This is all. Where I see the problem is that if you are forcing them to accept 
what you want. And you can do it for some time because you have, for some time, definitely you will have the, uh, the uh, enough force to do so, like the political, you can be prime minister for 12 years, and, and, and really you can force, or you can, you can uh, get the approval by just force, by just making the compromise, etc. I believe that in the long term it would be wrong because those who were silenced in, the, in those years would be uh, very loved. Yeah. So I believe that it's all about the education and the discussions and of course the public. I I'm, must say the other extreme, I'm not for referendums. I don't think that the referendum is a right to because we choose some kind of the um, of the political system which is based on the deputies. You know, I'm electing my deputies and the deputies decided for me for the next four years. I don't want to take it. So unless I change this system, the referendum is I am buying it. This is this is not But I think that the people must have a chance to tell their opinion, even if it's, if it's stupid, because they are the wrong. And either I'm a good enough to explain that guy that he's wrong, we should agree with that. Um, or I'm not good enough to, to pressure him. But this is the risk. And the positive outcome you can get, I believe, just by the discussion. And the presenting. Okay, you, you have to have a good argument for the common opportunity. I'm just saying, okay, show me how it's served to our foreign policy interests. This is the approach from uh, like uh, 20 years, and you know some people would like to see the Czech flag, to have a Czech flag, you know, everywhere around the globe, you know, it doesn't matter if there are two people or five people, it doesn't matter. But it doesn't serve to our national interest. It's based on money, it's based on the person. So we have to always find the last. I don't know if I, you know, answered somehow. But I understand you, it's, it's a very difficult. Yes. It's not a black and white. So, I think the time is over. <laughs>